Today we're going to look at Einstein's two postulates of the special theory of relativity. So there's three effects that we were talking about in the last video. The time slowing and the length contraction and the mass increase. They're really the consequence of two very innocent seeming postulates. And in fact we'll see that one of the postulates is kind of a consequence of the first one so we could just have one very innocent seeming postulate. So let's write down our first postulate. And it simply says the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. A very innocent looking statement. So we need to explain what do we mean by the laws of physics being the same and what do we mean by an inertial reference frame. Well, initial reference frame, that's easy. It's just a reference frame that's moving at constant velocity. So it's any reference frame where there's no acceleration. We don't have speeding up, we don't have slowing down, we don't have oscillations, we don't have turning. Our frame is moving in a straight line at constant speed. So what's meant by this phrase? The laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. Let's imagine you're inside of a box. And for now, let's build a window inside the box. There's our window. And say you look out and maybe you can see the Earth. Then you would be able to tell by looking at the Earth whether you're moving away from the Earth or moving towards the Earth or not moving at all relative to the Earth. However, if we remove the window then even if you've got all kinds of sophisticated physics equipment inside of your box here, there won't be any way to tell whether you're moving at close to the speed of light relative to the Earth, whether you're at rest relative to the Earth, whether you're moving towards the Earth or away from the Earth. As long as it's an inertial reference frame, as long as your box is moving at constant velocity, it can't be accelerating in any way. So what we really mean when we say that the laws of physics are the same, we mean that there's no experiment can be done inside the box, inside the inertial reference frame, to detect the relative motion of the box. Now your bedroom is kind of a box. So let's say at night you go to sleep. Here's your bed. You go to sleep, you draw the blinds, it's dark in your room, and during the nighttime, while you're asleep, s your bedroom is transported onto a big plane. So now it's on a big plane. And when you wake up, you're on the plane and it's moving at constant velocity. No turbulence or anything like that. Then you wouldn't know the difference. Everything on a plane feels just like it does on Earth. The physics isn't any different. And we really only know we're on a plane because we see references like stewardesses and pilots and things like that. Let's take a look at our second innocent little postulate. It says that all observers measure the same value for the speed of light and that really means speed of light in a vacuum, regardless of the relative motion of the observer. And we can kind of see this second postulate as being a consequence of the first postulate. Because let's imagine that you're in your box here and you've got your physics experiment and you shine a beam of light and you measure the speed of the beam of light and let's say you get a value of expected value 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. All is well and good. And then a few days later lots of stuff has happened and you do another measurement of your speed of light. And you shine your beam, you make your measurement, but this time the speed comes out to be 2 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. That would tell you that your relative motion had changed. And that would violate our first postulate. Our laws of physics have changed because there's some sort of experiment that we can do 
to verify our relative motion. Now it doesn't always immediately sink in how bizarre it is that all observers measure the same speed for light regardless of their motion. So I'm going to do a little analogy between baseballs and light to kind of bring that forth. Let's suppose we've got a baseball pitcher and he always throws at the same speed. Let's make that speed say three meters per second. Then of course if the catcher here catches the ball, he measures the speed of the ball, he will measure a speed of three meters per second. But if we put our baseball pitcher on a skateboard, and we'll make the skateboard say move at one meter per second, then when he throws with his speed at three meters per second, the catcher's going to catch it at a higher speed, at four meters per second, adding up the motion of the skateboard plus the motion given by the baseball pitcher. And if we move our skateboard backwards, say at one meter per second, and he throws it at three meters per second, of course the catch is going to be made, the measurement's going to be made at two meters per second all well and good with baseballs. So if we've got a flashlight and we just shine a beam, then our observer would measure a speed of 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. All well and good. But now let's move our flashlight and we can move it inwards at say a speed of 1 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. The observer here still gets the same value. It has no effect on that observed measurement. If we move the flashlight backwards, at 1 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. The speed of light measured is still going to be 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. It makes no difference. Even if we have our flashlight moving at, let's say, 0.99 times the speed of light, very close to 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, and we've got our observer moving at almost 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, the measured value for that light beam, the speed of that light beam, will still be 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So how could that be possible? Let's say that we've got an observer on a spaceship. And he does a little experiment. He sends a photon up, strikes a mirror, and then comes back. He's got an accurate timer. He knows the distance between the mirrors is d, and he measures the time it takes to go there and back to be t. That's going to allow him to measure the speed of light and that speed of light should be equal to 2d, because it goes there and back, divided by the time that he measured. Now, let's suppose our rocket ship is traveling with a relativistic speed relative to the Earth. And let's suppose an observer on the Earth is able to see that photon in its motion. Then because of that relative motion, the photon is going to travel a longer distance. Let's call that longer distance capital D. And of course it's going to have to travel that same longer distance on the way back. And the observer here on the Earth could measure the amount of time it took for that to happen. And he can use 2d over t to calculate the speed of light. So he would use 2 times this capital D over this capital T to measure the speed of light. But what's critical here is that both observers have to get the same value here for the speed of light. We know that this distance 2d is bigger than this distance 2 times little d. So the only way that they could get the same speed of light is going to be if this big T is bigger than the little t. So big T has to be bigger than little t. And that's critical. We always assume that time is absolute, but time is relative. Different observers measure different values for time depending on their relative motion. That is, time is not absolute. And time and distance are going to have to be kind of entangled. If everybody's going to measure the same speed of light, time and distance have to be connected. They have to kind of be the same sort of stuff. They have to be entangled. And so we have a special name for that entanglement. We call it space-time. One word, space-time. Space and time are kind of the same stuff. They're entangled with one another. 
We can kind of think of this entanglement between space and time, that which we call space-time, this way. The faster we move through space, the slower we move through time. So you'll recall, if we've got a rocket ship going through space, passing the Earth, then the observer on the rocket ship would see the clocks on Earth moving slowly. And the faster that rocket ship is passing by the Earth, the slower those clocks move. So the faster we move through space, the slower we move through time. So if people in different reference frames are measuring different amounts of time for the same events, then who is it that's measuring the correct time? Well, in relativity, we don't like to use the word correct time because it reminds us of absolute time. And in relativity, time is relative. It's not absolute. So we use a different term. We talk about the proper time. And I'm going to give you a kind of a simplified explanation of the proper time. The proper time is simply the time interval of something where that something is in the same inertial reference frame. So let's take our observer in the rocket ship. Let's say he spends 40 straight hours and he completes his extended essay. It takes him 40 straight hours. Then that extended essay is in his inertial reference frame and he would be measuring a proper time. But an observer here on Earth would measure a longer time for the extended essay on the rocket ship. However, if the person on Earth works for 20 straight hours on their TOK paper, then they would measure the proper time for their TOK paper. And the observer on the rocket ship would measure a longer amount of time for the time spent working on that TOK paper. So one of the things that's kind of important about proper time is that it's always the shortest amount of time. So if there's any inertial reference frame that measures a shorter amount of time for something than you do, then you're not measuring the proper time. In the last video, we introduced this gamma factor. And it was the factor that told us how much length was contracted by, and mass was increased by, and time was dilated by. And it was given by 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus the fraction of the speed of light, all squared. We're going to be able to prove that formula there, at least for the case of time dilation. And all we're going to use is the second postulate, the fact that the speed of light is the same regardless of the motion of the observer. And we're going to use Pythagorean theorem as well. But that's all we need to prove that equation. So let's take our guy in the rocket ship. And remember, he sent a photon up to a mirror at the top of the ship. And just to simplify things, I'm just going to have the photon go from the bottom mirror to the top mirror and not have it reflect back down again. Then if the distance between those mirrors is d, and the photon is traveling at a speed c, then that distance must be given by c times the time that he measures to go from the bottom mirror to the top mirror. And being as he's in the same reference frame as what we call a light clock here, that photon traveling between mirrors, this t naught here would be a proper time. Anyone else moving relative to the rocket ship would measure a longer amount of time for those events. So this guy down here, he would measure a longer time for those events. Let's say that amount of time is t naught, And he would see the photon travel a longer distance. Let's call that d. And d must be given by, well, he's got to measure the same speed, the same speed, the speed of light. But he's going to measure it for an increased amount of time. That's why he gets an increased distance. And we can make a little triangle here, a right-angled triangle. This side of the triangle is the same as here. That's just d equal to c times t naught. And the bottom side of the triangle, that's motion as observed from this guy's frame of reference. And it's due to a spaceship moving across 
at a speed v. So this distance here has to be v times t prime. So now we can apply Pythagorean theorem to this triangle here. The hypotenuse squared, ct primed squared, has to equal the square of the sum of the other two sides. So that would be v times t primed, all squared, plus c times t naught, that proper time, all squared. Okay, let's see if we can find this Lorenz factor, the gamma factor. First thing I'm going to do is expand the brackets here. c squared t primed squared must be equal to v squared t prime squared plus c squared t naught squared. Second step, I notice I've got a t prime squared and another t prime squared. I'm going to bring them to the same side of the equation. So I'll get c squared t prime squared minus v squared t primed squared equals c squared t naught squared. Next step, I'm going to common factor out that t prime squared, and I'll be left with c squared minus v squared equals c squared t naught squared. Next step, I'm going to isolate that t prime squared, so it's going to equal c squared t naught squared divided by c squared minus v squared. Next step, I'm going to divide the numerator by c squared and divide the denominator by c squared. So on the numerator, the c squareds divide out and I just get t naught squared. In the denominator, I'll get c squared over c squared, which is 1, minus v squared over c squared. Next step, I'm going to take the square root of both sides. If I do that, I get that t primed is equal to t naught divided by 1 minus v over c, all squared taking the square root. So if gamma is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus v over c squared, then that t primed is equal to gamma times t naught. In other words, our dilated time is going to be bigger than our proper time by a factor gamma, where gamma is given by this expression right here. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.